I switched the lecture to uh, to AR, um, partially because some of the topics overlap, or at least they're a good introduction to later class topics like haptics and things like that. So, uh, and also other VR displays because other VR displays um, that appeared before, like the Oculus Rift and devices like that, um, were a lot closer in a lot of ways than they, they were a lot closer to AR actually than to VR. For example, as we'll see, the original, what we call the VR display, was actually an AR display because uh, Sutherland was seeing the real world. But anyway, um, I'll get to that. So, uh, like I mentioned, Assignment 9 and Assignment 10, I made both extra credit, mostly because I think my original plan was to actually, well, before all the delays and everything, it was to have all the assignments be done by the first week of April, which obviously didn't happen. And you should obviously have at least a month to work on the final project, so it made more sense to just have you work on the final project. Um, so the regular credit assignments will be weighted more heavily. Um, if you did fine on them, I guess you wouldn't know for the last three, but uh, if you did fine on them, then I guess you don't have to worry about it at all, really. Uh, if you want to get at even like a decent amount of credit, you can just do very buggy versions of them. And they're all technical content, so... I don't plan on having any kind of uh, paper readings or anything like that. And so yeah, today we'll talk about AR. So if you recall from the intro lecture, um, I mentioned the XR spectrum. And this is some 2D graph basically that describes how you transition from AR to VR. And um, in a way you can think of VR, like pure VR as the user only sees or and has an understanding of the virtual world and nothing else. So, uh, for example, the like I mentioned that it muddies the waters when you have like ex inside out tracking like the Oculus Quest, which actually does need the real world to know where it is. But um, in general, you would think of, uh, you know, VR, VR being from the user's perspective, they don't actually know where the physical world is, which would still encompass most VR devices that exist nowadays, like the Quest, but I don't know, it's uh, it's ambiguous. MR is basically anything that is between the real world and VR, or it's between, yeah, between the real world and VR. And um, AR is essentially when they are mixed together. Well, AR is when the, you only have the digital world, or sorry, the digital world exists at the same time as the real world, but they are not actually being mixed together. So for example, the Google Glass only had UI elements, which augmented your vision, but they didn't actually have an understanding of the 3D world. Like your Google Glasses, they might have basic, basic locational data, but they don't know where you are in six degrees of freedom, for example, like the Oculus Quest does. But anyway, um, this, the spectrum is more of an idea than anything else. It's not really like, we, we don't use it for anything that serious. It's just a conceptual, you know, we have AR and VR, which technically should be on different parts of the spectrum. And basically anything in the middle is MR. And almost any device, like almost any head mounted display that you'll see that was made in the last few years would be classified as MR. Um, even though conceptually we know that there's the difference between something like the HoloLens and the Oculus Quest, because in the Oculus Quest you don't see the real world unless you're doing the Guardian calibration, and in the HoloLens you always see the real world. Um, it has opacity, but it can never be so opaque that it completely blocks the real world. But anyway, um, we'll get into this. This is just a recap. So, um, this idea of pure AR versus um, MR. In pure AR, you don't, like I said, you don't actually have an understanding of the physical environment, but you can still augment the user's vision. Um, and in these cases, uh, we'll talk about markers uh, in the AR part two lecture, but um, pure AR relies almost entirely on markers, which are these images that you know the, you know what they look like and you know how big they should be in terms of real world space. Um, so you can use camera calibration and other computer vision techniques to figure out where to place a 3D object relative to the marker. But even so, you only have an understanding of the marker, not the physical environment. Um, so, you know, you do this with basic computer vision and single camera views. So the assumption usually with pure AR is that 
you will only have a single camera like a phone camera. Um, because usually, I mean, the use case, we'll see this later, but the use case of having more than one camera is almost always to more easily figure out the 3D world. And in pure AR, since the user doesn't actually have a 3D view of the virtual environment relative to the physical environment, usually, um, well, we'll see some examples. You might not notice any minor errors in calibration. Like, for example, um, there might be an ambiguous depth problem. Those of you in the computer vision class might know about how depth can be ambiguous with a single camera. Um, but if you're looking at an image through a phone, for example, you don't necessarily know if the depth look, looks right um, because your eyes can't converge on an object that's not actually 3D um, with a single camera view or a single lens. So, uh, you know, you wouldn't notice if uh, it'll make more sense when I show a video, but say that you're trying to place some object onto a marker, you wouldn't really know if the object is correct, if, if its scale is correct in three degrees of freedom. For example, the object can be very far away. In terms of the 3D scene, your object could be very far away from the camera and its scale is gigantic, or it could be very close to the camera and its scale is really small. From a non-3D view, so you know if you're just looking at your phone screen, for example, you wouldn't really know if there's a difference there, um, unless you have occlusion or something like that. And usually there's no interaction at all between the virtual and physical environment. You just have these markers, which you can, you're basically just making predictions about where they are. And there's ambiguity in certain axes. So APIs like AR Core, AR Kit, etc., which we will talk about next time. Um, almost all the time, pure AR is in the form of video pass-through uh, with some single camera like mobile phone AR. Um, but we'll see examples of when it's not. Um, in mixed reality, you mix the understanding of the virtual and physical environment. Usually we need some 3D understanding of the physical environment, which we call spatial understanding, so that we know where to put the virtual objects in the real world. Like if I want to place a chair right next to me, um, I need to know, you know, what, what does right next to me mean to the headset that I'm wearing. And you can also, in the cases of reconstruction, we can use the physical environment to even just create the entire virtual environment, which is pretty common. Um, we'll see some examples. And also um, previously in the markerless tracking lecture, we saw the example of um, we saw some examples where, like, th there was that game where there were a bunch of projectors shooting at the walls and you were playing a game where, uh, you know, you're shooting these little critters that are, wall are walking around your floors and furniture. Um, in MR, you can still do that, and in that case, in the case of MR, your 3D physical environment is actually, um, you know, that is your virtual environment, so you can use your physical walls to place your virtual walls and make things shoot out of those walls and things like that. Um, but still, you need to know where they are. Um, in order to know where they are, we almost always need 3D reconstruction methods, which again, I'll also talk about next time. And we use what are called depth sensors to deal with the ambiguity of that extra axis that we can't figure out easily with a single camera view. Um, depth sensors are essentially uh, multiple cameras that are put together uh, statically that and we calibrate how far they are from each other and we use that information to uh, to um, figure out the depth axis. A lot of people in this class are in the computer vision class as well so you probably already have some understanding of how epipolar lines work and so on. I'm not going to go into it yet. Uh, the tracking methods that we talked about last time still apply to MR, active and passive markers, markerless tracking and so on. And uh, just to reiterate in modern VR and mixed reality um, the line gets sort of blurred about, you know, what definition is which, especially when you have inside out tracking. This is the tracking that you've seen already with the Oculus Quest. Um, and if you have a Valve Index or an Oculus Rift S, those also do inside out tracking. This is tracking where you use the cameras on the headset instead of external sensors to figure out where the headset is and how much it's moved and so, uh, things like that. So um, the ambiguity here in terms of the definition is how much do we actually need to reconstruct from the physical environment to figure out where it is? If you can do it with simple 2D computer vision, then 
you know, maybe it's not MR. If you need some reconstruction, then it probably is MR. It really doesn't matter, but it's worth thinking about and some people debate over it. I don't really think in terms of the development process it matters because the, as we'll see, the development process is pretty similar. Um, also recall this slide, uh, why were we studying VR specifically in this class besides it just being a VR class? Um, VR is just, it's, it's sort of easier to have a class on because VR technology is more widespread right now. And it's in the consumer sta stage, which means that these devices are way less expensive. Um, you wouldn't have firsthand experience with this. Most of you wouldn't, but VR APIs are a lot easier to work with. Um, some of you may have worked with the HoloLens before or the Magic Leap. You'll know that it is way harder to get those devices working than it is to get a VR device working. And it's way harder to test because most, uh, for the most part, um, you know, with, with AR devices, you don't have anything like the Oculus Link to, um, you know, you don't have anything like that to make it easier to test uh, with. So Matt, for those of you who did assignment five by building the project over and over again, imagine that, but with an even more annoying API, which doesn't always build correctly or works inconsistently or, you know, you need to delete the cache every time you build it. There are just so many annoying problems and, you know, people like Nolan and Shake have already worked with these devices and you know how rough they can be. Um, with in, in VR, as many of you have realized and as is sort of evident by the fact that moving to a quarantine classroom wasn't that hard for us, we can still do things in VR sort of the same way that we do them in non-VR. There are extra considerations that we make, but the optimizations are still more or less the same as regular games, which is not true for AR because AR is fundamentally different. The virtual environment, in terms of building the actual environment, we actually don't really worry about that in AR. In AR, we try to use the physical environment, which obviously changes as you move from room to room. So, you know, it's just harder. Um, in AR as a technology, we focus more on things like tracking stability, reconstruction, and so on. And in general, and as will become evident from these lectures, AR is a little bit harder to grasp because it has this real world component. There's a little bit more, um, there's a little bit more focus on how do you get the virtual and physical objects to align correctly? How do you deal with problems like distortion, which may not be as obvious in VR as they will be in AR when you're trying to align some virtual object to a physical object and the virtual object is slightly distorted and you're like, wait, that line is not actually straight because I have some real point of reference to show me that it's not straight. Um, and you know, things like that. For game developers, VR is a more natural transition, um, partially because the optimizations are similar to regular games and also because they are both almost entirely virtual. And uh, at least the thing that should give you some comfort is that the stuff that you have learned in VR actually does apply to AR for the most part, including the game development experience. So uh, even though AR is harder, uh, you are actually building up a skill base that will help you work on AR eventually if you want to. So anyway, to move on to the actual content of the class, the original VR paper, we call it a VR paper, but in a way it's a, you know, it had a, Sutherland 68 was a very important paper and it had a lot of contributions in terms of rendering and AR and MR and just graphics pipelines in general. Um, but their display ultimately was an MR display. They were trying to render this cube um, and superimpose it onto the real world. And you can see that the perspective is changing as the user rotates the cube. The cube rotates when the user rotates their head. Um, so there is some perspective part here. It's not just a UI element that is superimposed that never changes. There is an actual 3D object that is changing with respect to the person's head pose. Uh, so in VR and AR displays, and in AR displays especially as we'll see soon, we have this fundamental problem called the Virgin's accommodation conflict. And the idea is that we have this screen that is in front of our eyes and our brains, if we, unless we trick our brains, our eyes, our brain just wants to focus on the screen that's in front of us. Um, but we, we trick, we, we use stereo displays to trick the brain into thinking that it's looking at something far away. But the problem is that even if our eyes can converge on something that is far away, some virtual object that's far away, they're still ultimately 
focusing on a or their focal distance still ends at the screen itself as opposed to this object which means that the the focus doesn't work the same way like even if your eyes can be convinced that this object is 3d there are still some visual restrictions that come into play uh vergence is how far the object is that we want them to focus on and convergence is your eyes both intersecting at that object accommodation is where your eyes stop focusing and this will be the screen in the case of ar and vr or in ar we have the extra problem of we actually are focusing or when we are not looking at a virtual object our eyes actually do follow real world um convergence accommodation but when we're focusing on the virtual object it switches to this conflict uh and the implications of this problem are in terms of focusing, if you don't actually bother to trick the person into looking at a 3D object, the, the eyes will just converge on the screen itself. So um, imagine if the Oculus Quest, instead of having one display per eye, if it had, you know, a single screen that is one perspective, obviously you wouldn't be able to focus on anything on or any of the 3D objects on that display because it's simply impossible. You only have one view and it's way too close to your eye to actually focus on anything. In terms of defocusing, um, even if you get the virgins problem solved, if you can fo get them to focus on the 3D virtual object, um, the implication of the focal distance being restricted is that depth of field won't be correct because you don't have, you know, you don't have a 3D field. You just have a single Z value basically for where the screen is and it doesn't vary in depth and what this means is that if you don't if you don't um actually if you don't do anything to solve this problem everything will just be in focus so you, if you look at this image which i thought was pretty good i need to make sure to put the citation in here um in the real world when you're focusing on this point in 3d uh the sides become defocused because that's just how optics work these become your peripherals in vr or in AR when you're focusing on a virtual object, everything just seems in focus anyway, even if you can convince yourself that this is a 3D object. And in AR, um, you know, you probably have realized this just from me talking, but since the real and virtual objects are mixed, um, you know, you switch between these two problems and the distortions become more and more obvious because you have a real world point of reference. So. Uh, first, I wanted, before we get into the actual technology of AR, I wanted to talk about some of the displays and how people deal with this virgence accommodation conflict. So there are two main categories that we'll see. Um, first are video pass-through devices. And I've already kind of explained these. You're looking at some opaque screen that is showing you the view of the camera on the other side, but you yourself are not directly looking through the camera. Like think of you know, think of the iPhone, for example, um, mobile hey, AR. This... In mobile AR, you're looking at the screen itself, right? But the camera perspective is actually up here somewhere. So there's some offset that makes this uh, not that realistic. And even with something like the Vive Pro, where there are two cameras on the front that you could use to approximate the eyes, um, there's still some offset from the actual screen, uh, which means that depth is still messed up. So. Video pass-through is used for simple AR, but uh, it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't handle depth or perspective that well. Um, and all, mo pretty much all of you have done the Oculus Quest Guardian calibration, and in the calibration you see some black and white image of the real world. Um, but obviously you can't, as you've seen yourself, you can't actually focus on anything that well, like nothing looks 3D, and things are heavily distorted, like uh, if if you've, played, if you've done the hand test where you put your hand out while you're trying to calibrate, you'll notice that your hand in this black and white camera image looks a lot smaller than you know it is based on your um, kinesthetic sense. The other type of, cat the other category is optical see-through or pass-through. These both mean the same thing, but they're used interchangeably. Um, in optical pass-through, what you can do is either reflect the image of the virtual world off of some combiner, which is, it's usually a mirror, it's usually some lens that is translucent. This image actually says it's transparent, which I don't think is right. 
Um, it's translucent, which means that it can reflect the image back into your eye. And um, you, well, this is the first way of doing it, where the, the image just appears on this display and you can see it. The other way that you can do it is by sending the rays of light directly into the eye and not bothering to try to create the image on the combiner itself. And we'll see an example of virtual retina displays which do this. Um, optical see-through devices are most of the mixed reality headsets that we actually care about. And the image that the person sees still doesn't need to be 3D. Um, for example, we'll see the Google Glass pretty soon, which does not actually project anything 3D. They're all UI elements. Um, but even so, uh, whether or not the objects are 3D, that doesn't affect the, uh, the actual display design. So like I just mentioned, Google Glass is not mixed reality, only adds some UI elements. But the HoloLens does, is mixed reality because all the elements that you can add to the virtual scene have some six degree of freedom position in the real in the real world. And a lot of people in the class might not actually know what the HoloLens is. I'll have um, some examples of these devices soon. So uh, one type of display is the uh, spherical or semi-spherical large combiner, which are these headsets. In this type of setup, you have a screen or some type of projector like this one that it basically just shows an image as if it were a regular monitor, but it is reflected onto these panels. And you'll notice that these panels are, tr they're translucent, you know, they're not perfectly transparent. Um, there's some opacity, uh, some tint, um, but it's not actually a tint. These are covered in some kind of material that can reflect the screen at a higher resolution than if you were to just reflect them onto your window. In these headsets, the combiner is very large, like this part here is the combiner. Uh, but with these headsets, you can get a very high field of view. And it's generally not too hard to get the optics right because there really isn't that much other hardware besides the screen and the, um, the lenses. And we'll talk about this later probably, but you can just mathematically figure out the distortion of these lenses. So for example, when the screen reflects onto one of these panels, the image that you're seeing is going to be a heavily distorted version of the one that the LCD is showing. So what you can do is distort the LCD's image beforehand so that when it gets reflected onto the combiner, it looks normal. Like it looks like, uh, you know, from the, pers from the perspective of the person wearing this headset, it looks like a rectangle or, it, you know, things just look undistorted. These, fortunately, are some of the cheapest AR headsets that you can find. Uh, so, for example, this headset that I'm showing you is from Amazon. Um, it's $60, and it's just, you know, it's just this. It's really simple, but you could do some cool things with it, probably. Like, uh, it doesn't have any kind of tracking, but what you could do, for example, is maybe just have UI elements that follow the person, like notepads or, uh, I don't know, text messages or anything like that. Um, but obviously these headsets are gigantic, so I don't know if you would want to use these to look at text messages. Some higher tech examples of these combiners. The Meta 2 is an example. Um, this is a headset that was proposed a long time ago, and it came out a few years ago, and then the company went out of business. Um, it has a very high field of view, 90 degrees, which is the field of view of the Oculus Quest. Um, in my experience, the tracking is very questionable, and I think most people would agree that it's a little bit iffy like um, especially if you're too close to an object. It has some built-in hand tracking, which is pretty cool. It's wired to the PC, which is unfortunate because obviously we want to try to keep these, these devices as wireless as possible so that potentially people can just bring them anywhere without their computers. The company itself went out of business because of um, Trump's dispute with China, their investors pulled out or something like that, but they're actually reviving the headset and creating a new one soon. So. Their, their headset design was pretty interesting and it had a high field of view and it's ugly as hell, but um, you can do some interesting things with very high field of views. And as we'll see when we get to the more complicated examples, um, 90 degrees field of view is actually way better than any other headset that is high tech and six degrees of freedom. The 
Um, another example is the Leap North Star, which you might have seen in the lab when uh, Shake was banging his head against the wall trying to get it to work. You can build this, or at least the, the hope is that you can build it for less than $100 because the Leap Motion itself, which is a hand tracker that we've seen before, is like 35 bucks, I think, and they give you some glass panels and um, some hardware and you can 3D print the rest of it for pretty cheap. And uh, the overall headset is supposed to be less than $100. Um, I think that's probably a low estimate, but in any case, um, it has hand tracking, which is pretty cool. And the Leap Motion is a depth sensor, which was already really, really good at hand tracking. So the actual hand tracking quality, as you can see, is a lot better than what the Meta 2 can do. Um, I don't think the Meta 2 could ever track fingers correctly, but it's hard to find good examples online of it working or not working that are not promotional. Um, the Leap North Star was open source, which is pretty cool. The form factor is pretty awful. Um, it's definitely not a pretty looking headset, but you know, it's cheap and you can build it from scratch, which is cool. It doesn't have any built-in hand tracking or any built-in six, six degree freedom tracking of its own. Um, I believe that they do rotational tracking with the Elite Motion itself, but I don't remember. Um, you could ask Shake because he was messing with this. <clears throat> anyway, um, to get six degrees of freedom, like translational movement, you could attach a Vive tracker or some other thing like passive markers, which people have done before. Now, moving on to near eye displays, which are the displays that are a lot closer to what you're probably familiar with um, because they're very close to how the VR headsets that you work with. I forgot what I was saying. They're, they're much closer to like the Oculus Quest or Vive than any of the other displays that you've seen before because they are just showing you the display in front of your eye. Um, you might have noticed that the Oculus Quest and Vive have very big LCDs in front of your eyes. If you tried to put those on a pair of regular glasses, that obviously wouldn't work. So the screens on AR, on AR near eye displays need to be a lot smaller. And we also have an optics problem, which I'll get into soon. Uh, you can do near eye displays in a couple of different ways. You can use light fields, which we'll talk about soon, which are a pretty cool idea. If you use a device like the HoloLens, the HoloLens, is, <clears throat> the HoloLens optics are really complicated, but they use some, they use micro displays basically, which are these very, very tiny displays, which shoot out a couple of or they, they basically shoot out like a bundle of rays of light. And then this device or this part of the optics engine called the waveguide, it helps bounce the light to where it's supposed to go. And then you have a small combiner onto which that light gets pushed onto, um, which the user will eventually see. Oh, I had a simplified explanation here. But yeah, the idea is that from these micro displays, you shoot out some light rays and you guide the light rays into, onto the combiner. Um, you can do it by shooting light directly into the eyes, which I mentioned before, and we'll see the example soon. And the basic goal of these types of displays is that you wanna make the form factor as close to just typical glasses as possible. You don't want these gigantic spherical combiners because nobody would wear those in public. If these, if AR, if and when AR ever becomes a thing that is commercially accessible, to the public, nobody is going to wear a device like that. Unless they, unless Star Trek ever becomes a reality, but I, even then I don't think they would. <clears throat> um, near eye displays are very complicated in terms of technology. And so the explanations that I'll give you are very high level. Um, I have a set of resources that I cite way later that you can check out if you are interested in how the optics work. But near eye displays do, they rely heavily on how the actual optics is designed. There's a lot of there, there's a lot of tiny little hardware um, that is interacting and needs to be calibrated and needs to be angled in a certain way. And uh, you're, you're, most of these devices take advantage of how the eyes process light. And so there are some simplifications that need to be that can be made. There are some complexities that aren't intuitive. It's just a hard process. Um, it's one of the reasons why. The HoloLens and Magic Leap just aren't very well understood devices because they are so complicated that people don't really know how they work. And also the companies that made them uh, didn't explain them very well. 
But anyway, I'll explain those devices soon. Um, I mentioned twice now virtual retina displays, which are these devices that are supposed to project the image directly onto your eye. So instead of trying to form the image on the combiner, what they do is use the combiner to reflect the rays of light such that the image gets formed behind your eyeball, which is sort of how real light works. And this is a very emerging technology. I think the first like decent implementation came out in 2013 or so, and they're still working on the optics. But here's an example of one of these headsets. And we'll talk about light fields soon, which is an important technology in understanding how this works. But what they, they have these combiners, and the combiners are not actually um, the image is not forming on the combiners. What they are doing is shooting the images into their eyes. So this actually isn't a great video to show, to get an example of how the tech works. It's just showing that it does work. And also you can, you can see these passive reflective markers being used to track the device in sixed off. Um, but the benefit of these types of displays is that by forming the image behind the eyeball, what you do is it it's pretty it's assumed that this generates a much higher quality image because there's not as much dispersion um there's not as much um randomness caused by light setting and things like that but yeah the optics are not they're not they're not simple did they ever show an example of how the actual headset works i don't think they do i think this is mostly a promotional video Anyway, you can check out the promotional content later if you want. But at a high level, that's what it's doing. It's trying to form the image behind the eyeball. And um, you can sort of get a sense here of what the optics looks like. They have... I actually don't remember exactly how it works. But they have a bunch of hardware here that is handling... That includes like the waveguide and things like that, which are trying to push the image into the eye. Um, and this one I think is opaque, but hers was not. Anyway, these are super emerging, but you might see them somewhere. Some examples of other near eye displays, which you're probably more familiar with, are um, the HoloLens. It originally came out in 2016, and it's pretty much the de facto standard for AR headsets, or at least stereoscopic AR headsets. The HoloLens 1 had a field of view of only 30 degrees. And if you can recall what the Oculus Quest looked like, um, the Oculus Quest field of view was 90. So imagine a third of that field of view. And you can imagine that the HoloLens's field of view is pretty small. And I'll also show an example soon of what it looks like. Uh, it has a front-facing camera. It has some grayscale cameras on the side, which are used for tracking the environment and doing some... I think they assist with reconstruction. It's not really well detailed anyway anywhere that I can find, at least. Um, but there's a depth camera on the front, which I think is the primary source of reconstruction. And maybe the environment trackers help to some extent, or they're used for corrections or something like that. I'm not really sure. Um, and then there's some IR illuminators, which if you recall how passive markers work, um, especially the OptiTrack system, they are shooting IR rays at the passive markers, which the camera in the middle of that light array could detect. The HoloLens is sort of doing the same thing. So it's shooting these IR rays out so that these cameras can see it easily. Um, they have speakers very similar to the Oculus Quest. So this red part here, or I think it's orange, it has a speaker array inside that is pointing towards your ears so that you can hear the audio and other people will still be able to hear it, but it won't be nearly as loud. It does have a headphone jack as well, and it has some volume buttons and opacity buttons. However, it's expensive. It was $3,000 $3, minimum when it first came out, and even nowadays I think you still can't get it for less than like $1,500. The hardware itself is very similar to older smartphones like the Galaxy S4, so uh, you could imagine that it's pretty weak, especially its graphics chip. Um, I think it's probably even weaker than like Intel HD graphics. It's not great. And uh, you really can't use complicated shaders at all. In fact, the HoloLens toolkit comes with shaders that they want you to use that are optimized to work with it. 
and uh, they're pretty ugly. I mean, they're mostly unlit shaders or just like textures. You can't do physically based rendering on the HoloLens, definitely. Um, the HoloLens 2, which came out technically, but it's so backlogged that we've been waiting like a, a year and a half at this point to get them, even though we're waitlisted for like 10 of them. Um, anyway, it has a field of view of 43 degrees, which is quite a bit better. It's still not amazing, but it's definitely better. It's design, this is the HoloLens 2, by the way. Its design is very similar to HoloLens 1, except its form factor is a bit better. It has better weight distribution. So on the, on the HoloLens 1, um, it was kind of just like the Oculus Quest. If those, if those of you who have used an Oculus Quest versus a Vive, you'll probably have some sense of this, but the Oculus Quest keeps pretty much everything in the front of your head, which means that the weight load is all on the front of your face. Um, which can be a bit uncomfortable and it causes the headset to slide. The HoloLens 2 is more like the Vive where there's some weight on the back so that um, it balances on your head a little bit better. Um, the, it has hand tracking, which is pretty cool. I believe it also has eye trackers, but I don't remember exactly. And its hardware is a lot stronger. Its hardware is very similar to the Galaxy S8, um, which has a very, very good CPU. And its graphics card is pretty good as well. It's not as good as Apple's, but um, there, it's you know it's still pretty good and it's definitely much better than the HoloLens One's hardware, and it would be cool to work on it if it ever gets shipped to us before I graduate, which definitely won't happen. Um, both of these devices use a version of Windows RT, which um, it's sort of like a watered down version of Windows 8, but the API is similar to Windows 10 or Windows 8. Um, so a lot of AR developers already knew how to use it, and it works with a lot of other devices like you've probably seen the Microsoft MR devices, for example, which um, there were some really cheap VR headsets, which were made by companies like Acer. Um, the API that the HoloLens uses overlaps a lot with those devices so that you can share a lot of code, which is convenient, I guess, if you're making multi-platform stuff. We don't really have much multi-platform applications that work between VR and AR, but it's a cool concept. And the hardware is all self-contained in the headset itself, which is a huge benefit. As you've noticed with the Oculus Quest, the hardware is all dispersed along the headset itself. Um, so it doesn't actually require any wires to run. And, you know, it's just really nifty. I think the HoloLens was the first six degree of freedom AR headset that didn't require any wires, which is important from a technological standpoint. Um, Another example of an ERI display that's, that you've probably seen before is the Magic Leap 1. It has a field of view of 40 degrees horizontally, which is definitely better than the HoloLens 1. It's slightly worse than the HoloLens 2, but you know it's still pretty good. This is essentially a HoloLens competitor that was funded, it was funded by Google. My mouth is breaking. And it was funded by Google. Um, I, don't, I think they still are funded by Google. It's the only reason that they haven't gone out of business. Um, the hardware is still, it's not that much stronger than the HoloLens 1. I think it's slightly stronger, but it's not that much stronger. It has eye tracking though, which is a pretty big deal as far as AR goes, which we'll see soon. Um, it has little eye trackers here and some sensors, I think here. I think these little things here are IR illuminators, but I don't remember off the top of my head. I think the actual IR cameras are these though. Um, they have this remote, which is tracked in six degrees of freedom. So if you have it in front of you, like you can actually do things with it. Like you can sort of play games in the Magic Leap. Like they have Angry Birds AR and things like that. The hardware itself is not stored in the headset. It's stored in this little thing called a light pack, which you're supposed to hold in your pocket. It's not that intrusive. And it does make the headset itself a lot lighter and more comfortable. The... OS is very similar. It's some variant of Android that's called Lumen, which is probably why Google funded it, or at least it's one of the reasons why they use this OS. Unfortunately, as a platform to develop on, there's not a whole lot of content that you can actually expand from. Um, like they don't have a lot of great example content, but you know, that's just how emerging technologies works, I guess. Some platforms are not, they don't come with great example content. Um, one major drawback is that they don't work, it, it doesn't work with glasses at all. Um, like with the HoloLens, there was some space for you to wear um, with glasses. Like 
your nose rests on this, but there is some offset between the combiner and your face such that you can still wear glasses um, with the HoloLens. With the Magic Leap, you can't do that. It's so compact that you literally cannot fit glasses in there. Um, they wanted people to buy special lenses, which are kind of expensive, and MR is already very inaccessible, and people didn't really want to do that. Um, I think some people did it like the hardcore fanatics did, but still, I don't think it's a great idea to add even more reasons that people can't use this technology. Um, another example that you have probably seen back when it was a meme is Google Glass, which had a 13 degrees field of view. Um, it had, shake is dying. Uh, it had a 13 degrees field of view, which is pretty awful. It came out in 2013. These fall under a category called smart glasses, which are basically, it's essentially AR, but on an actual head mount instead of a phone. Um, so really these can only show UI elements. They don't have any understanding of the physical environment. They have a tiny, tiny field of view, which makes them borderline useless for most things. Um, and the offset was always seen as being really weird because you can only see things at like the top right of your view. One of the main reasons it flopped was because back then there were problems with safety and privacy. In terms of safety, uh, Google wanted people to wear this while they were driving, which is not a great idea because it had lag, it UI elements are just distracting and things like that. But more importantly, there were privacy concerns. I think that the device was meant to record people all the time. So there is this camera here that is like always recording people that are in front of you and sending the data to Google so that they can improve predictions. But obviously this is not a great idea because those people didn't consent to being recorded and nobody knows what Google does with any of their data. In 2013, I don't think that people were as accepting of the companies just have all of your data anyway, um, which I think we've more or less accepted at this point. So uh, yeah, people were really worried back then. Also, from a developer standpoint, the API was terrible and it was very poorly supported, as are most things made by Google that flop. They are trying again. Well, they actually did try again. Um, in 2019, they made a new version of the Google Glass that focuses on industrial applications. Um, it is this design. Um, and now it uses Android instead of some proprietary OS that's not easy to work with, which is a good change, definitely. Um, and focusing on industrial applications might be a good idea because you can show things like instructions and processes of how to do things and so on. Um, another example that you've probably seen more recently are Apple Glasses, which are not released yet, but again, this, this is another type of smart glasses. And their goal is to basically do what the Apple Watch did, where you just take some of the stuff that your phone is spitting out and put it onto a different device. The FOV seems pretty big, which is pretty cool. Um, but apart from that, we don't know that much more about it. They're mostly concept drawings. I think this is probably a lot closer to what it will actually look like. Um, but I think that this was the type of, I think this was the form factor that showed on their patent or something. So some challenges of these displays are, you have this debate between brightness and opacity. You want the virtual image to be bright enough that the user can see it, but you need to balance this with the opacity of the combiner because if the combiner is too dark, then you won't be able to see the real world correctly. Everything will just be really dim. So um, people have found some creative solutions around this and the HoloLens, I think, the Magic Leap's combiner is definitely a bit too dark. The HoloLens, I think, did a pretty good job of handling this balance, but most of you haven't used these headsets, so you won't really know. The field of view in these devices is pretty tiny. And again, you can compare to the Quest field of view, which is which is actually pretty small for VR devices nowadays anyway. The hardware is weak because we want these to be mobile devices, but um, you also want the form factor to be reasonable, which means you need to pack the hardware into very small, um, you know, into small spaces. The Oculus Quest has a benefit of people aren't that worried about how big the headset is as long as it's comfortable. I mean, people know that VR headsets are ugly and they're really not meant to be worn out in public anyway. Um, but AR headsets, if you want them to be publicly accessible, if you want people to actually use them for the practical reasons that they're meant for, like, you know, utility, UI, um, 
being used as mobile devices, uh, like the Apple glasses and so on, um, then you need to, you know, you, you need to find some way to get stronger hardware into a smaller and um, a nicer form factor device. Uh, we have this virgin accommodation conflict, which becomes more of a problem the closer that the combiner is to your eyes, because the closer that something is to your eyes, the harder it is to focus on it. So we'll see that the focus is actually usually off. Um, here is an example of the field of view problem. And fundamentally, field of view is just an optics and display problem. You can't really do anything about it from a software perspective. So um, this is like when you record something on the HoloLens, it shows you what seems to be a very high field of view. But from the perspective of the person who's actually wearing it, the field of view is actually much smaller. So as you can see, this little virtual interface is right in front of this person, but um, it'll get cropped at some point as he spawns things. So he spawns this astronaut. And you can see that he's actually pretty close to it. He's only a few feet from it, but he can only see a very tiny segment of this, this object, which is, uh, you know, it's just a problem because you can't really handle any kind of complicated interaction when the field of view is so small. I mean, most of you are gamers. You probably know what happens if you turn the FOV slider way down in a first-person shooter or something like that. You literally can't see anything. And that's the case for the HoloLens and near eye displays in general. Um, one way that this problem is being addressed is with varifocal displays. So with varifocal displays, you have multiple combiners or you have an adjustable combiner um, the adjustable ones are usually called membranes, and they will reflect different parts of the image at different depths. So for example, something that is farther from you might get reflected onto the membrane that is farther from your eyes if you have multiple membranes, or you would adjust it so that your eyes focus on that depth. Um, and I'll show you examples in these videos. Um, the idea here is that if you have multiple membranes, it seems I forgot the sent to finish the sentence, but when you have multiple membranes, when the user looks at the part of the virtual image that they want to look at, they're already naturally focusing on the membrane that's farther. Um, the problem is that these devices usually have a lot of moving hardware, which um, you probably know from, I don't know, I, mean, I don't know, 541 or files and databases or any of these classes that deal with hard drives or any kind of hardware, that moving hardware leads to breaking or losing calibration. Um, the Magic Leap 1 had multiple focal points, I think, which the HoloLens didn't, which is pretty cool. Um, here is some example of this display that Facebook was working on. I think it was called Half Dome. Oh yeah, it is. Uh, so they have this moving display and it's, I'm not sharing audio, but it's very loud. And uh, he was showing this video of a person trying to use it and it's making all these horrible noises as it works with his eyes. And you can see that they have to do eye tracking. I mean, generally you need eye tracking to know where the person is looking. This is something that somebody at UNC worked on. He graduated a few years ago, um, but he had a deformable display that <clears throat> um, what it did was when you try to focus on something that's farther, the membrane will distort physically so that you can focus on the thing that's farther. So there's a virtual, a physical object and then there's some virtual objects. The stamp I think is physical. This is physical. This is physical. I think the aliens are the only thing that's not physical. Anyway, I think we're at the end of the class, so I'll save this other content for next time. Uh, light field rendering is pretty cool. And uh, some of the tech was actually developed at UNC as well. So um, it's a cool thing. But we'll talk about it next time, I guess. Bye.